And good afternoon. It is 3 p.m. here on Friday, August 28th, and we are keeping our conversations with the candidates going, and we are sticking in District 72 today. And uh, if you are a candidate uh, and have a primary election coming up on September 8th, well, we invite you to get a hold of us um, so that way we can have you on um, for discussion. Um, you know, the Let's see here. It is uh, a week from Tuesday is the primary. Wow. Getting here. Hi, Mr. Because, President. Hey, I remember you. I remember you as well. And we are just going to talk for a couple minutes here and uh, just go over some of our uh, campaign coverage. Um, I put out a email. If you are not signed up for our email list, 20,000 people are, I would suggest you sign up for it. It is by far the best way to make sure you never miss a single video, a single story anything ever from us, sign up for it. But just a short while ago, I put out an appeal um, asking for folks to support our election coverage. And uh, you can read all about that on our website. But uh, our newsroom and our business is mostly powered, and I'm very proud of this, by our readers and by our viewers. And uh, to ensure we have the resources to properly cover uh, this election, uh, we're asking for your support. So uh, visit whatsupnoop.com and you can read all about that now. All right, so what we are going to do is we are going to stay in District 72 today. I love when things line up and they make sense and we're not throwing seven. I feel like I'm uh, 71, 74, 75, 70, you know, all over I, the place. <laughs> yes, we'll have District 76 on tomorrow. There's not a 76. Yeah, there you go. But um, we are going to be joined by Mr. Chris Seminelli. And Chris, good afternoon. Good, after, good afternoon, Ryan and Frank. Thank you for this opportunity. Of How course. Are you, Chris? And Frank, you heard Chris, and Chris, you heard Frank, and everybody can hear everybody, correct? Perfect. This is a good thing. Good start. That is, is a good that, start. Chris, is it cold over there? Because you, you got earmuffs on. Uh, this is the best way I find <laughs> to find out what's going on, to hear it clearly. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, if for some reason uh, people don't know who you are, Chris, uh, why don't you tell us, give us a little bit of your background, and uh, who is Chris Seminelli? Okay, so uh, I'm Chris Seminelli. I live on 542 Walcott Avenue in Middletown. I've been married to Trish Seminelli for 40 years. We have six children and nine grandchildren. I graduated from Middletown High in 73 and CCRI in 77 with an associate degree in engineering and Northeastern University at BS in honors in chemical engineering and an MBA from Pepperdine University. Uh, don't hold that against me. Um, most of my education is, is self-supported, and I, I, my, my business experience, I worked for Exxon for in, in New Jersey until uh, 1982, and then moved on to a textile company in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, uh, Cooley Incorporated, um, and worked up to the point of vice president of sales and marketing, left them in, in 98, and uh, went on to a company in Israel dealing in, in thermoplastic products, industrial products. And I also handle non-competing products. So I'm a rep, a manufacturer's rep. Um, uh, about a year ago, they did a joint venture. So we're working now with a company in New Jersey and with Israel, they combined. I have an office in um, down in the old WADK location. I've been here for about a year. Absolutely love it. You know, everything is walking distance. Um, my, my For a while, my my family owned the Sears store in Middletown. And so I had my daughter and brother-in-law managed that at the same time. And I just worked there on weekends, handing out bread and shaking hands with people. That is by far the most thorough bio that we have had yet. And somehow, <laughs> but first, two things. Uh, Frank and I spent... I think both about three years in that building um, that you were in, in your office. I love it. I love it. I just, and um, you didn't mention any of your political background and career. Sure. So um, I had, um, I did three terms on the, um, the town council in, in Middletown to, to as president. And I was on various boards. Uh, I was on the, uh, beyond that, a charter review board, a coyote commission, a few uh, regional high school um, programs. And I did that for about three terms and then, um, you know, then then left and went off into the business world. When was it that you left the council? 
So that was uh, it was about twelve years ago. Okay. And now no, nothing in politics uh, in between. Um, just you know, uh, uh, it's a very good question. Advocacy. Uh, once I left um, the politics, what I did is I focused on educational improvement programs. When I was a president of the council, I toured um, one of the businesses and asked if the Northeastern had a mentoring program, co-op program, and I asked if there were any students there, and there were none. So I, I got together with a whole group, including Steve Heath, who was from Fab Newport, and what we did is we, we had this Newport mentoring program, and what we would do is every 60 days, we would load up a bus and send students with us through uh, various venues, whether it was the Naval War College or composites manufacturing, to show them career programs. After that, this this same group, what we did is we developed, uh, uh, we think that STEM and STEAM education is extremely important. And Massachusetts has a strong program that we'd like to, to emulate. So I was with one group, we started a charter school um, initiative. We actually applied for a charter school and it was approved to the first level. It was going to be in the Boys and Girls Club, but we uh, we didn't get the funding. We needed five hundred thousand dollars to convert um, that. That and then after that, we had um, we we had a couple summits. We had a STEM summit and uh, at a Salve Regina, uh, where Commissioner Gist opened up, and we also had a, a STEM summit at CCRI. So the advocacy has been there for for me for a while, and that's kind of the fun part. You we wake up in the morning thinking of that. After that, I'm sorry, but uh, you asked. After that, um, I transitioned over. We have a disabled child, and I transitioned over into the uh, the ad- disabled advocacy pro- environment. Um, we um, so I joined um, uh, the DD Council, which is up in Providence. Um, and also Rye Force, which is a which is a group of parents at, that have an advocacy initiative, and I also have a, a 501c3. And what we do is we fund initiatives, like we funded a an open house for parents that had kids, and then we had we had um, people come in and and talk about the issues that are before them. And so that that was kind of the springboard, really, for the beginning of um, my reentry into politics because I saw some things occurring up at the state house that I was not happy with whatsoever. So let's dive in there, Chris. You are running for House District 72, which is Middletown and Portsmouth. Um, let's talk about uh, why you chose to uh, run for this seat. Why are you running for office? So um, again, um, one of the things that I was not happy with was budget cuts that were occurring up, up at the state house at the DD and um, in Buddha, it's Buddha's the uh, the organization that handles disabilities. And um, for a period of time, I was on this side of the microphone fighting for budgets. Uh, the the governor was cutting budgets back two years ago of eighteen million dollars. And so I went before the microphone with a group of people, and we were able to put plug that hole again. Um, then recently, um, in the last. Well, actually, I've been running for eight weeks now. Total eight weeks uh, from the idea to being on the being on the, the Zoom with you. And um, what I was noticing that there was something called work share. And what they were doing is the uh, representatives of Buddha that that are talking to people and providing answers for them were taking two days off a week, and they were getting paid the six hundred dollars um, a week. Uh, salary was supposed to be paid by the government, which is a good thing, I guess. But it was it was um, it was breaking down to forty percent less in service. And I said, "That's it. I, I, I just totally had it. I need to get on the other side of the microphone." And I said, that, "And that's the canary in the mine. That's the issue that is going to grow." And since then, it absolutely has. The uh, Supreme Court came back. A, a judge came back to uh, the Buddha group and said that you are not providing the services that are needed for your individuals, and you need to come back to us in 30 days with a plan on how you're going to fill these holes of lacks of service, and you need to tell us how much money that you need. And um, I'm a part of that group to help them with those answers. But at the same time, then recently, two days ago, um, there was this announcement that Buddha is looking to cut their budget by 15%, and they're looking for ways to cut the budget. So, but this isn't just a Buddha um, disability initiative because I feel that this is happening across the board. We're going to see that from all. I'm active, still act very actively involved in education, 
um, you know, senior senators, senator, senate, seniors initiatives. And um, what I'm seeing now is there's going to be a lot of pressure on us in Newport County to maintain our budgets and to push back at the state house. And I think we need to do it as a coalition. I have experience in doing that as a coalition. When I, when I was on the council in Middletown, I worked with the mayor of Newport. I worked with the president of Portsmouth. Then we met monthly and talked about programs that were going on. So I think going forward, I think we need to do that again, but I think we need to pull Tiverton in and Lilla Compton in as well. Now, Chris, you are, and Frank, I'll let you get started here in a minute. Uh, you are running in a Democratic primary. So uh, what's the difference, biggest difference between you and your opponent? That's a really good question. I, 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 you know, I, I um, pretty much like to look at um, my, my plans going forward. And what I, what I am going to do is develop um, um, a strategy in order to make sure that our plans are on target to meet to meet the budgets going forward. Um, I think that some of the programs that up at the state house right now aren't working. They're, in fact, they're horrible in terms of service. And my my plan is to go is is to be um, action oriented. Is to, is to make the change. And I am a great team player, and I can pull together a group to, to push back. So that's that's where I'm at. You know, I I I admire anybody anybody today that is in service. Chris, I'll follow up on that in a different way. Uh, have you supported your opponent in the past? How you know what we did was um, uh, as a part of the initiative for the uh, disabilities arena. What we, what we did was we copied the STEM type uh, program. And we actually had a disabilities uh, initiative at CCRI that they supported. And what we did was we had, because you know, there's not a lack of knowledge and understanding of the disabled programs. And what we did was we, um, two years ago, we had the people that were running for office, um, well, we had them on the stage and we asked them to talk about what their, what their projects were and, and, and what they thought where we should go. And at the same time, uh, because I had been in their seats, we were not putting them on the spot. What we said is these are the questions that we're going to ask. These are types of, you know, in terms of things that are handled elsewhere in other parts of the country. And this is how it's handled in, um, in other parts. And these, so these are some suggestions, but you can, you know, come up with your own ideas as well. We want to have an open dialogue. And at that point in time, we had, uh, yeah, we had President Papa Weed open it up and she did a great job. And we just talked about 12 years of budget cuts. So uh, that's, I, so because Terry went to that, I guess, <laughs> to answer your question. No, well, the question was, have you supported her in the past? Um, I haven't really come across her. I mean, I really haven't really... All right. And just is that I would say that support because I invited her up there on the stage. Frank, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so many uh, places to go. I, I want to uh, I want to stay with the these uh, the the budget, however, and uh, you talked about uh, programs being cut. What specific programs are you talking about outside of of the uh, disabilities? What other programs? That's right. Education budgets are extremely important. Um, I think that they're going to be under the gun radically. And I think, you know, obviously I, I have some um, um, some background in, in uh, regionalization efforts. I was on the CESU group. We were part of the team that put together the, the 1,200 signatures that, that we got. I think that that has a place. It, it has to be um, vented, you know, vetted with the community and they have to agree to it. I think that uh, senior citizens' budgets um, are, are, are very fragile, that I know that in some of the, um, the senior centers that there's a major part of their portion of funding, and it was a great article on that, are supported by Medicaid, and two-thirds of the nursing home residents in the state have cut Medicaid budget nearly for every year for the next for the last 12 years. So that, that's that's one of the, uh, the the budgets that that I think are important. The other thing that are important is the uh, mental health budgets. I think that um, one of the initiatives, one of the uh, one of the, the, the you know a great person, the president CEO Jamie Delahane at Newport Mental Health has po has pointed out that and he and he called it he called it the healthcare and human services providers 
in Newport County, including Newport Health, that they've been fired by their individuals because they're not providing the level of service locally that and their individuals are going up to Providence um, to work well, for services up there. So that, that's another one of the, the budgets. And then the veterans, one of the things that, you know, as I walk around and I knock on, I've walked over a thousand doors. And as I walk around, one of the things that I am hearing was from some veterans who said that, why are our benefits taxed when they're not in other states? And I said, well, that's something I'll pick up. And, the, and they said that basically this has been studied before and the proposal that was developed went into a committee and never came back out again. So, Frank, Frank, what's your background? I'm sorry, I know you guys are talking. What's my what's... background? Yeah. Well, I'm, a, I'm a professional bocce player. No, <laughs> long-time <laughs> journalist. I came up to Rhode Island to work for the Providence Journal. Yeah, I worked for the Journal for about 15 years, editor of the Business News for about yeah. another 10, and did some PR for the, uh, uh, the Rhode Island Blood Center. Yeah, and thank you. Doing, yeah, doing radio and, uh, and uh, working with Ryan with What's Up New. How about you, Ryan? What's your background? Uh, well, I uh, graduated with a degree in fire science and uh, was a volunteer firefighter in EMT in my hometown of Coventry. Dispatched 911 for a little while. Went on to work with the New England Patriots for almost 10 years. Uh, um, went on to work with the American Cancer Society. And he was a linebacker, by the way. Since, <laughs> since 2012, I've been uh, doing this thing here called What's Up Noob. So, yeah, good for um, you. Well, you're doing yeah. a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to dive in to kind of give us a directions of where we're going to go here today. And if elected, Chris, into District 72, Middletown, Portsmouth, what are your top three priorities? Yeah. Um, um, well, and it, Obviously, I think what I've said is that we need to protect the budgets, disability budgets, education budgets, senior citizens budget, the elderly and mental health. The disability budgets are incredible, under incredible pressure. And I, like I had mentioned that they just got it. They're just talking about another 15 percent reduction, which is an absolute joke. Um, DSP workers that are uh, their uh, disability service providers in the system themselves are making less than $15 an hour and good disability workers have a passion and they deserve to make more than $15 an hour. So that's, 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 that's part of what, what um, one of my initiatives are. So um, developing the coalition that I've talked about, the pushback at the state house is a number one priority for me. And, and again, as I, as I've walked through, I've identified um, is issues that that are extremely important. One is that veterans, right, need uh, need to have their retirement protected. Um, the, um, the 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 I think that the, what had gone on in terms of uh, Portsmouth Middletown and East Main Road is is a joke. I think that that needs some serious attention. And I think that um, I think that honestly, I, I I've talked to some, quite a few people had some reasonable, rational ideas on how to handle that. Um, and I think that we then I would go to D.C. and, and to uh, Senator Reid, which I've had experience with quite a few times in some of the initial, initial education initiatives and talking about funding. I think the, one of the things that I had heard, too, was that um, across from the soccer fields, um, on the Oakland Farm traffic light needs to be re replaced. Uh, well, not replace it. They need one. And they, they've been talking about this for a few years now. Um, the poor people out there, as I'm knocking on doors, they're asking me, when are we going to get our light? It was, it's already been approved that some one of my initiatives is to get that funding for that, for that light. Um, also, again, as I'm walking, walking the streets, um, across the new gas station, right across from the, in the, the intersection, right across from the Union Road, there's a major problem with people getting out on that. And it's been studied um, um, with the problem. A mother told me yesterday, she said, you know, I'm, I am not going to take my car with my children and step on the gas and go out into the middle of East Main Road because the guy's beeping his horn behind me and because I can't get out because of the speed, the speed on that road. So that is absolutely one of my initiatives. And, and another one, the final one is that, um, as I'm walking again in Middletown, um, I, again, people point this out and things are so obvious that um, as people go to Second Beach, when, they, when they're when they going to the beach, you know, Purgatory Way Road is usually the way to go. 
but um, um, but it, it backs up. And so people, are, what they're doing is they're taking Green End Lane as a shortcut, and it's like it's like uh, it's like Mario Andretti going you know going down the Indianapolis 500, zoom right down, and there's nothing slowing them down. So I'd like that to be studied, and we'll see what the experts come back with. Maybe it's a stop sign or two. So those are some of my initiatives. Those are my three. It when seems like there's a lot of traffic issues. Well, um, these these are the uh, I, these are some of the ones the low I call it low hanging fruit. But traffic issues are the easy ones. These are ones that are being pointed out by people that have been been partially studied, almost done. But when you're at the ninety yard line, you don't have a touchdown. The budgets are the are the most important part of what's going on. And and in the COVID experience that we're in right now, the school opening issues are extremely important too. too. Those are m- monstrous issues now, like before. Just to stay with the traffic for a minute, because um, you know uh, we heard earlier today from your opponent that you know Oakland Farms is getting a traffic light. It is scheduled. It doesn't even need funding. It's being done in 2021, early 2021. Yeah. Um, and also, um, she went through the whole DOT thing. I mean, it, it seems like um, those things are in a different place than where you may say they are or where people may think they are. And, and you know what? Maybe because I mentioned them, they're, they're becoming a little more highlighted than they were in the past. Um, but I don't see any direction on East Main Road. And I and from what I had seen and as a result of that last meeting, it's still nowhere. And so I, I don't agree with that. Um, I don't look at it like I have an opponent. You know, I, I just we're, we're both in service together. And they, some point, some people can have their view. And it's, it's OK to talk about these issues when I bring them up. But they're not resolved. And the people that are that are involved in and specifically, they're not resolved. In fact, when when the, the light was mentioned um, at Oakland Farms, uh, it was mentioned by uh, one of the senators that there's no money. That's what I was mentioning, with no money. So if I mention these and they get resolved, and that's some gravy on my on my uh, campaign. Well, I also just want to clarify that uh, to the average voter, you do have an opponent because they have to choose between you and somebody else when they go to vote on September 8th and November 3rd. So that's why I say opponent. No, but I Frank, don't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I'm with you. I'm just saying I I just acknowledge people that are that are in service across the board. I just, I just think there's some things that need to be fixed. I'm going to fix them on my term. Go ahead, Frank. Let, yeah, let me ask you about uh, uh, a number of things. We start with um, the uh, Gina Raimondo's reaction to the uh, COVID-19, uh, to the point of the schools now, economically. Right. How's she done? I think that um, I think the governor is doing a great job. Um, schools should open carefully, um, but I think that, and I think Colleen Germain has done a great job too, of listing some of the specifics that need to be done. You know, it's 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 really scientific, right? It's it's really it's it's a math thing and it's a science thing. The um, the thing that is less science oriented are the emotions that become in, in, impacted, and will teachers come back? But um, I think that what I did is I watched a, a, a webinar, which you get to see a lot of them when you're working from your office. But I saw a webinar on um, the chamber, and it was the National Chamber of Commerce. And they had somebody who came in and talked about the, the issues with COVID. And there's a, there's a book, and it's 40 pages, and it's a guideline on how to open a school. And what they said basically is it's all about testing, and it's about six feet, Okay. Six feet, you're not going to have a problem. Testing and follow follow directions in this book, you're not going to have a problem. But five feet, you'll have a problem. Four feet, you'll have a problem. The other thing that I think is um, is uh, another issue, and I, the commissioner of education mentioned it earlier in um, this week. She has something called the commissioner's uh, newsletter, Commissioner Corner, and and I thought I thought it was very insightful. And what she said is that there are some students that cannot learn from Zoom. They need individual attention. And we need to pay attention to those students. And we need to bring them into the schools. And the other thing that was most important, and this kind of touches on the economy a little, is that the parents of those students need to work. They need to go out. They can't stay home and and educate their students. In fact, and some of my relatives say, I'm not good at it. 
I am not a good teacher. And so I think the fact that um, the governor wants to open the schools, I think the fact that the commissioner of education recognizes that um, these students need that education, but also recognizes that it's a social issue, not only just an education issue in ride. And these students and the and the fact that these parents need to go out into work is, is part of their obligation. And I thought that was that was tremendous. Um, so that, that's basically uh, my overview on, on the COVID. And I totally support the governor in terms of the direction and where, where she's going with this. And I think that she's very careful. The only thing, the only concern I have is about losing the governor because, um, you know, this is her, she's gone now in terms of term running. She doesn't need to be here. I think she's going to hang out for, for as long as it takes to get this done. But I'm sure D.C. is calling her. Um, I, I know that I think that she has some, you know, good connections with D.C. And so I, I'd just like her to see her finish this before before she heads out. You know, I, I, the governor, too, I have also uh, when she when, when she went through the uh, unions and um, she was she was unbelievable. That little thing was sitting there and the unions are like, you're not going to take our, our pensions away from us. And she held her ground. It was you're absolutely about when, she was, when she was treasurer. Yeah. And she was absolutely amazing. She and she just looked them in the eye. Then she just said, she said, we have a math problem. OK, it's just a math problem right now. And that's what she's doing right now, too. She's saying to people and that's a little bit of that Italian background, too. I think she says she goes, when well, you're going out, knock it off. And I, and I think she's she's gone to respect. But I think we follow her and she's following the, uh, you know, the the the. Um, the healthcare professionals at the same time, I think we'll be fine. Um, well, she is, um, she's also back um, battling with the unions in the whole COVID thing, in the school thing. You've got, as I understand it, the eight communities that have said they are going to open remotely are communities that uh, the teachers are represented by the American Federation of Teachers. I'm not sure where the National Education Association comes down um, uh, or whether they have or whether any of them have made any kind of a, a, a public statement. But um, it, um, uh, I guess, as, as someone suggested to me, it, it's right now a game of chicken and we're going to find out what happens on Monday. Well, and, and she's done this before too, right? She did this. She did this with the uh, with the unions, and she did this with the governor when they were when they were looking at the pensions, right? And somebody flinched on one side, and that was Chafee, and she went right back to them and she said, "Knock it off. We all agree to this. This is going to happen." So I, I think I think I think she'll stand her ground. She, you know, she whatever. She's just a, she's just a light heavyweight. She's like a you know, she's like a metal metal fist and a silver glove. She's just a velvet glove. You know, she's she's absolutely amazing, and she uh, was she was very she was very involved in STEM education, right? She looked at she she brought in um, a, a consultant house to look at our whole education initiative, and she identified what what needed to be done what needed to be done, and she um she she the the price tag was was 150 million dollars so that was that was large to swallow but she but she understood what she needed to done and i think we need to continue to move along those lines back to covid for a minute uh, businesses throughout rhode island are suffering what do we do to help improve the business climate what would you do to help to yeah. improve the business climate during and after uh covid19 pandemic uh, you know um so that's a, like a bear trap kind of thing, right? First of all, where we're at on the, on the restaurant side, 40% of the businesses are, could go under, right? So there's, there's a regional restaurant group, right? A regionalized restaurant group that is offering suggestions on how to open. And I think we need to listen to them. And I need to think we need to work with them. I think the fact, though, too, I think that the fact that I'm sitting there staring at tables outside here where you guys stared out these windows at one time. You know, I, I think that the, the city has been flexible enough and the tables right opening up on the outside were, were a godsend. And it, especially after uh, all, all the change that had occurred. So I think that those those are some the thing I'll tell you we shouldn't do. And that's just Chris speaking. 
is that we need to be careful on minimum wage. We just need to be careful, okay? I talked about DSP and I talked about those workers, they're not making what they deserve, but to just carte blanche raise minimum wage, is this a little concerning for this, uh, that I think we need to offer offsets and taxes too for the, for the, for the um, at this point in time, at this sensitive point in time, for the restaurant owners and for the people of the lower wages, because it's not like they were making a killing in the first place, right? To, to able, oh, we'll just increase wages and everybody will be much better off. Well, it's a variable, and you're going to you'll have to raise you'll have to raise prices, and that will have a, a major impact on the economy, which is something that we need, really need to be careful about the economy going forward. Interestingly, there's a uh, uh, there's a Warwick City Council candidate who was advocating for a $15 minimum wage for all state workers, uh, but doesn't suggest how, in fact, you pay for that. Right, right. It's a, it's a zero-sum game, right? Uh, we're with you. We should, we should have a requirement that for every suggestion of a raise in wage, there should be a suggestion of a lower cost or initiative or a regionalization or some way the state can help to offset that. Because because they're under pressure, they're under incredible pressure. There's great people. Some of the people out here just opened. Their, they just opened the restaurants just now. You know, the little frap things. You know, and the poor things out there. You know. So I think we have to be very sensitive to that. And again, this goes back to also what we were talking about: our social responsibility for those for that mother whose child is going to school because they have to, and she has to go out work. Well, she needs a job. You know, she she needs a job, so it's a it's a closed system that we need to help help out with. I wanted to jump to uh, to one of the taxes, as long as we're in in that vein, somewhat. Uh, a few years ago, three years ago, I believe it was, that the state enacted the speaker's um, uh, speaker's initiative to eliminate the car tax, and it was over several years. We're in the third year of that. The um, uh, the the revenue from the car tax was revenue that went to the cities and towns. And under this um, un, under this program, the state is reimbursing the cities and towns for the money lost uh, from the car tax. So my question is, do you continue to support that, uh, given that we're, we're looking at a uh, hundreds of millions of dollars deficit on the, on the state level? Um, and do you think, in fact, if, if that does continue, well, this, the state is gonna be able to sustain its position of reimbursing the towns for lost revenue. Greg, I, th I think that's a really good point. I think if we have to reevaluate that. I think we really, uh, we're, we're having, gonna, gonna have a massive deficit ahead of us. And I think that we, that is a program I think we need to reevaluate re as well. But uh, I mean, a, a massive deficit. And so as we're going to be pushing back um, as a community, the five towns pushing back to the state house, we need to offer ways to help the state offset that deficit. And I think that's one of them to your, to your point. But I think that uh, we have to be very, very careful. It's going to, it's going to be very dicey uh, going forward. Can I stay on dicey for one minute? Um, and that's um, another <laughs> potential, potential revenue area is uh, legalization of marijuana. Where do you stand on that? Yeah. Um, I, isn't it amazing? how busy those places are isn't it it's just absolutely amazing i mean you know i, I get my haircut done out at, at uh in portsmouth and holy cow trying to get out there you know they have people uh, uh, uh organizing the traffic in their little parking lot and it's just it's incredible and all the whole shopping center is full so um, legalized right now at this point, and I don't support that legalization of marijuana. I don't support that. I, I, I think that they're, they're very, very busy as it is, but I, I just don't. I, I don't support that. Chris, I'm going to bring us back to 72, District 72, and Frank will probably keep us at the State House. So we'll, we'll yin and yang here. Um, what do you see as the biggest opportunities, issues, and needs for District 72, your portion of Portsmouth, your portion of Middletown, and are they the same in both communities? You know, um, it's a really good point. I, I just have to keep going back to budgets. I don't think we know how bad it's going to be. And I, I think in terms of education, I think we're going to need to continue to fight for education. 
for the dollars that we need for education. I think that perhaps, I don't know if regionalization fits in it, but I think we need to have that opportunity because that is a, a potential way to save costs. It's not why I would do it. It's not why I would do it. I would do it because it's going to better education. It's going to provide more initiatives for that. And, um, you know, um, again, you know, okay, so it's low-hanging fruit. It's, it's not sexy. But some of these, these, these things like East Main Road, okay, it's insane. I remember when I was a kid riding a bicycle down East Main Road, right, to the, uh, to the, the ice skating rink, right, and, and coming back and saying to myself, I'm going to die. Right. I'm going to die on this road of my bicycle. And it's the same road, you know, so it's it's not a little deal. It's a big deal. And it's a deal that um, I somebody actually told me. And this is Chris, you know, designing on a, a napkin here. But some a state worker told me, look, I'm ready to go out there with a shovel and do this. OK, if you look at one side of the road, there's utility poles. OK, that's a great side for a path. If you look at the other side of the road, there's enough there's enough pathway over there to take five to 10 feet and not hit a wall. Right. So you could widen this road. You just need the dollars. This isn't that tricky. And you don't, you don't need eminent domain. So I, I think I think that's extremely important. I just think we're going to be so busy talking about budgets and where we're going to be plugging the holes and how we're going to keep our businesses alive right now and how we're going to need to listen to our businesses to figure out how to make it easier for them to work. Like we have the, the tables out here in front. We need to find those other ways to, to help our businesses. This two years, this two years, I don't know why anybody would run for office for these two years because this, this is going to be something else. But I, I, I am a, I'm a appointed person. Um, I do things that aren't popular. I haven't always done things that that um, other people agreed with, but were right. And I took the I took the hit every time I needed to do it. And I think that um, I know that that's the type of attitude you need now going forward. And I can do it. Frank. So one of the big programs going on is, of course, you've mentioned infrastructure in a sense with East Main Road, but we have infrastructure projects from one end of the state to the other. Um, it seems like when I when I go for a, a, a drive that I usually get to someplace in 15 minutes, it takes me at least a half hour because I've got to get delayed by by some project. The um, the reason the state's in the situation it is because on the on the roads and bridges is that the money that was designated from the gas uh, gasoline tax never really got to maintaining the, the roads and bridges. Right. The 9-11 money never got to 9-11. The, um, the tourism money a number of years ago uh, was, was drained out of, the, out of the state tourism budget, and it all went into this black hole they call the general fund. Right. Um, now that we're making all these changes to our roads and bridges, we're fixing them, um, it would seem that there has to be a mechanism to make sure that the money that is uh, there to maintain them is there. What... It doesn't seem the General Assembly has had an appetite to do that. Um, how would you how would you help change that? Well, I, I would I would look at it in depth. Um, you know, I, and I guess also there was some tr question about whether um, the control should be tr moved from the DOT to uh, to another group. And um, I I don't support making that change. I guess what what I am talking about the, where I'm talking that the funding is going to this going to you know, when, I think you're going to get the deer stare when you go to Rhode Island and talk to them about we need some more money for roads. I think really where the money needs to come from is the feds. And I think that Senator Reid would have an appetite for investing in, in the roads and in, 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 in particular this, this road. So I, I, that's where I think the funding is going to come from. Would you be supportive or would you initiate legislation to assure that money is not diverted from uh, from where it is specifically intended um, into into the general fund. I, I I just need to look at that, Frank. To be honest with you, before I okay. uh, let's see here, we go back to seventy two, and we are looking at uh, what do we do to make seventy two Middletown and Portsmouth more attractive and affordable place to live for everybody. That includes families, for seniors, for veterans, for all. Yeah. Okay. So 
Um, every day I, I run two or three miles, right? Not real fast. And some people say you're not really running, Chris. And I, and I watch the, the sun come up on Second Beach. And I, and I, I would just say that we, we have one of the most beautiful places in the country, if not the world. And so in terms of beauty, I think what we need to do is we need to protect it. We need some subtle things like, you know, maybe a walking path going up purgatory. I think, I think that uh, Portsmouth is absolutely gorgeous and, and, a, and a lot of spots that, 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 that has it. Now, on the other side, and this is, I think, the, something that I've always felt is that well, one thing that we need is a convention center. To help, it would help the um, help the economy uh, drastically. I think that as you go around the country, and I when I was flying, go around the country, when you say I live in Newport, everybody knows it's beautiful here. And I think this is my opinion. I think that the uh, the visitor center is nice, but I just don't think it's it, it had the traction that it needed. And I think that um, a convention center would be absolutely unbelievable to to build, and perhaps. You know, perhaps it can be in the old High Lie location, which which would be right off the bridge. You could have nice transportation going into town and enjoy the restaurants um, and the and the beautiful venue. And so I, I absolutely think something like that. And I would entertain if other representatives or senators would want to have that conversation. I would absolutely think, and I and I think that some of the people in the um the uh, the, the 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 board the the uh, whatever the, the transportation board. The Bureau of uh, um, um, whatever it is had an interest in it too. They said, "Think, Chris, that's a great idea." And I just think, I just think that would help capitalize on everything that we have. It would take care of the problem of high light, right, which doesn't have a, a, an owner or renter, and it would be a, a natural coming off of the bridge, absolute natural coming off. And of the I, bridge. Carpinano does have plans out on high light, and it is privately owned, and they are looking to put two hotels and a bunch of retail stores as well as, uh, Frank, what right. else was there? Yeah. Residences for, uh, for yeah. Uh, people working in the area, um, yeah. office space. Yeah. They, pretty, they had pretty, two pretty hotels. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, then, well then, then, uh, well then then have it down here, you know, do something with a visitor center. So expand it. So make, make a, a Newport convention center in that, in that area. If that's, if that, if that's what it takes. See, and the other thing that you can do too is because what, what we're, we're all enjoying is we have a curve, right. Of travelers right around the summertime between the June and the, um, you know, well, then the September, right. And that was four months. You can, you can schedule it and time it so that you can bring and have activities that you can bring it in in the slow times as well and bring in and help fill the hotels and the restaurants on by having active programs and the conventions would not be seasonally related. So I'm in the industrial textile fabric business. So you can have the IFAI show there and they are in, 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 um, in, in November. And you can bring people in, and that would help bring in traffic, and um, and absolutely support, and then keep our restaurants. So you're, it helps to smooth out the seasonality of what's going on. So I just wanted to follow up. So what do we do to make it more of an affordable place, a District Seventy Two for families, and a better place for families? Well, you know, and that's what you said is extremely important. Um, affordability. Okay, one of the things that I've talked to, um, and I, this came up a little bit when we were doing an initiative looking at um, some of the large home issues was that some of the people today um, that have businesses cannot find workers because they, they don't have a place to stay. They can't afford, afford to be here. And so I would totally support the development of, of, of low cost apartments in, in other parts of the country. Actually, what they do is they have communities where they have, you know, larger homes and then they have smaller apartments. And I know some businesses that would absolutely support that. And that would provide a living space for, for these people so that you're, they're not having to commute in from, from way outside that. So I, and that just that is such a no brainer. And some of the business business owners, you know, like Bob and some of the business owners said, when are we going to do that? And some of the architects, brilliant architects, said, that's this is something. And then maybe you offer some tax incentives to build these at the same time. And that's what happens in other communities as well. They offer tax incentives to build these smaller units that are that are affordable housing that then helps that helps fill this manpower deficit that we have right now. 
Um, I want to take a left turn, if, if we might, and that's to uh, one of the major issues of the day, and that's Black Lives Matter. Um, I want to get your take on that, and I want to take uh, get your take on uh, whether or not we have any kind of systemic problems in uh, in Rhode Island and on Aquidneck Island, and uh, what uh, what legislators can do about that. Yeah. So um, um, I'm, we were a Navy family, and so we were called like Navy brats, um, and we moved around the country and. Basically, the community that you were involved with were a multiracial environment. And so we and we were in a multiracial environment and we didn't know it. OK. And we just we just had a blast, absolute blast and got along extremely well. And I think that there's a couple issues that, that are occurring and things that can help enhance this the situation. One is training does help. Um, I was at Exxon um, in the um, oil business. And we, we actually had we had training, um, gender bias training on it. And one of one of the things that, you know, you didn't realize that you, that you had an, a slow tendency towards bias and you didn't realize until you got at the end of that. And, 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 and I think that that training makes a difference. I think that um, one of the things that I've advocated for and has really bothered me and I don't there's not an answer. But when we were looking at the charter review, I was on the charter review board, was that we need more people of color on our councils and our school committees. Um, and that that would help tremendously because that would help them guide us along away from making decisions that were gender biased. That, you know, you, again, you, you, you're not purposely biased. You just don't see it. And if you can have more people of color on the council, and on the school committee, that would help you out tremendously. And the thing that when we were doing the uh, regionalization look, um, and it, it was unbelievable. When we were, uh, we had, so we had uh, um, Newport this week uh, hosted a, a regionalization look, um, and they, they were interviewing students right, on the school. And they asked, they asked a white Portsmouth high school student, they asked her, they said, do you support, do you support regionalization? And she just looked at them and she said, yeah, absolutely. She says, we're too white at our school, you know, and, and that's a part of the education process in, in, in itself. The other thing that I think that in terms of uh, do we have a problem? I mean, it's easy for Chris to say this. I, I can just tell you that um, I think that protests make sense, but peaceful protests make sense. And I think that what Newport did um, in terms of helping when they understood that the, there was going to be a protest, a peaceful protest, they helped. They helped. They helped guide the traffic. They helped. You know, they helped the people uh, move move around. So and I think that type of thing makes sense um, going forward. I think the other thing in terms of uh, do we have a problem? I can just tell you, we I'm on the, uh, the Newport, the Middletown Rotary, and we we sat down with the chief of police. Um, and then because uh, as a part of Rotary, we, we uh, one of uh, Hector Robles, one of the things his idea was to uh, better integrate people in the uh, community, have them to understand the, the police activities. Um, and one of the things that um, the chief of police in Middletown pointed out was he said that we are one of the well, like 10 percent of the stations in the country have department certification. And that's what we have. We, we certify, and, it, and I think it makes sense that it's done in Middletown. And one of the things he said was that, you know, as a part of certification and your, your approved um, ways of handling people, he said a chokehold would have never been done, ever have been done with a certified, um, a certified um, police department. And the other, the other thing that I, I totally support, too, is body cameras. I think that on the police, I think that makes sense. And I think that it made sense to the, to the chief, too, he said, because that's feedback. You know, we can always learn more. We're not, you know, we want to be transparent as things are going forward. And so we absolutely we're going to absolutely support that. So I think but I think, um, you know, when um, it was it was interesting, it was on that Saturday of the protest. You know, I saw um, I saw the guy who runs the surf place surf. And he says, you're going to the protest at three o'clock. And I think oh, we all know who I'm talking about. And so um, um, I said, uh, you know, no, I had something. 
and he was down there. We had we had it was an integrated protest, is what there was down there. Everybody support the people from Fab Newport. Everybody realized that we need to have our eyes more open, and we need to prevent what happened. You know, it's the chokehold happening here, and we need to understand ways of preventing that, like the certification. And we need to do the training. Some of the ideas of training had come up, um, and we and we need we need to have more people of color on the council, and we need to have more people of color in the school committee so to help us make these decisions. So somebody can raise their hand and say, "Wait a minute, have you thought about this?" Like some of the things were said when I had the gender training. So. Um, I hope I answered your question, but I, I think some of the people that I had um, had conversations with um, have there are some no brainer ways of preventing massive problems right now. And I think it's just totally unfortunate what is what is occurring elsewhere. But I think that uh, things like that we do already in, in terms of sort of and it's expensive and, and, it, and it's elaborate. And in fact, I was just talking to a police officer because he's he's down Mike from the um um, he's on the DD council. He's the chair, and I'm going to be the vice chair. And he said, Chris, we do certification training also up there. We have 450 people on our force, and we just, you know what a pain in the butt it is? But it is a good pain in the butt. We just had. So, so, can I, Chris, can I ask you this? Because you've said it a few times. What are they certified in? What's the certification? Well, the, 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 you know, like uh, NFPA 701, you know, there's um, in terms of um, procedures and follow up, you know, and accountability, things like that. Like ISO has accountability and procedures. And that's what it is. It's a certified practice that they have. And, and that was what Mike was saying. It was we had groups of 50 do it. But one of the things that from what I understand, and I don't I'm not an expert in it, in that obviously some of the things that approved levels of handling and next generation ways of handling situations. He told me chokeholds would not have never been approved after, after the, the, the police department was certified. Frank, and I'm going to follow up here um, and bring up the question again, because hopefully we can stop that before it even gets to a chokehold or anything close. Yeah. You know, what can we do to make our communities more equitable, more fair to improve race, race relations in our communities? Well, I think I, I just identified about six of them. Before police that, training, what can we do for no, neighbor no, to neighbor? I mean, one, I think, I think, I think, the, um, I think that it, it, it goes back to the, a fundamental level of, um, you know, uh, the people that are establishing policies have to be sensitized to uh, r race importance. And, and that's by that's by having more people of color. Right. And then we tried to do it in Middletown by by issuing by changing the charter. But you can't do it by changing the charter. That's not that's not the way to do it. You should you need to make it easier for people in the community to run for office of, of, of color. Of, of Chris, don't, you think, don't you think that responsibility rests with the political parties? Don't you think that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, if they believe that there are more should be more people of color on the council, school committee and other places? Uh, need to go out in the community and find out who was there and recruit people to get involved. I think I think you're I think that's being done now, isn't it? I mean, on the gender, uh, there's a whole uh, group I think that uh, on the with, with females. I, I I know I had talked to uh, one of the people running for uh, for uh, the legislative uh, office. And she she recruits females right now into so, but I think you're right. But I think I think it's I think it's it's just it's across the board in order to bring them in. And the other thing I think too is I think that um, one of the things that we had in, in the Rotary was that we reached in to Oxbow, and what we did was we had. We had a um, we had a, 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 a night at Cardine's Field, and what they did was uh, Cardine's gave us free tickets to a game. We paid for the hot dogs. The Boys and Girls Club um, provided the bus, and we brought those kids in from Oxbow into into a ball game, and they absolutely had a blast. Somebody was telling me my son was for two days talking about the the game that we were going to have and seeing them. What's the, what's the mascot there, the Cardinals? And seeing them, whatever that bird's name. Well, and seeing that, was that? It's a goal. 
Yeah, the new gully. Seeing the, yeah, seeing them run a gully up and down the field. So I think I think more of that needs to be done. I think we need to reach in to the Oxbows and break and get them out because we might as well be, you know, we you know, Carnies might as well be, you know, um, even like the beach. Some of the things that the boys, girls, and boys and girls club, the YMCA are doing in terms of bringing them to the beach is tremendous, and I think more of that needs to be done as well. Frank, why don't we uh, why don't we move off to climate change uh, and uh, some of what you're seeing in terms of climate change, some of the needs that there is, uh, particularly around Aquidneck Island, and uh, what can right. the state be doing to try and mitigate the impact of climate change? Um, well, first of all, I think that you know there are some states and there's some philosophies in terms of um, I think we need to continue to work to reduce our carbon footprint. I think that there are things, carbon offsets that are set for, uh, that, that can be developed and there are established policies and programs that work in other states. I totally agree with solar cells. I think solar cells make a lot of sense. And I think that, um, I think wind turbines in the right place make a lot of sense. Um, I think that we need to be careful because uh, wind turbines in non-intrusive areas um, have a, um, a that's not that's not reasonable. I remember when I was on the council um, and I, I toured a home in um, in Middletown and we came out of the home and I was with President Art Weber at the time. And we sat back and we said, what's that? What's that huge whooshing sound? Right. And it was a wind turbine across the street. That was was that was whooshing, and and this particular um, family was complaining about that. And I, and I think so. We need to be careful about that. I don't think that makes sense. But I think wind turbines, like at Portsmouth High School, do do, 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 a, do a tremendous job. And I think at the YMCA as well, do a, do a tremendous job. So I think I think overall, I, I'm I'm totally support of of the green initiatives that I identified and, and open to other ones as well. Chris, what do we do to improve education in Middletown and Portsmouth? Obviously, always room for improvement. Okay, so um, I'm on the board of Fab Newport, and Fab Newport is a maker. They have a maker program, an education program, and a coding program. I think that um, what they do is they fill a space with coding and and 3D printing that the uh, the local uh, uh, the local teachers don't have the capacity to do at this particular time because they're so busy. And so what we do is we bring teachers in um, and teach them uh, 3D printing and we bring their students in. And so the, uh, the, um, the Rhode Island Department of Education actually has initiatives that, that allow parents to bring their students into a Fab Newport or whatever it is to, to, uh, to bring them in and allow them to, to, to be a part of 3D printing. And so I think that you need to excite the students in the middle school, in the high school level, because once you do, there'll be less of a burden for teachers. And I think then that, that they'll, you can help set their career directions. It's like the PSD workers that I was talking about too. We should have, we should have training programs for them in the high school level. And they also maybe a, a, a graduate program, a CCRI graduate program for them so that they get an advanced degree. So then they'll, they'll get advanced dollars for that. And so doing that has, has a huge amount of power. Um, in terms of integrating and exciting the students. And I'm not adverse to other, other the, the one of the things that we tried to do um, after the charter school initiative is it dawned on us that you don't need a charter school, right? You don't need everything. You don't need to create an English. You don't need to create a history. You just need to create the venue that you're after. And so one of the things of what we tried to do with another group with President Dooley, and it was part of this, this group, was to develop an advanced manufacturing program. Because I think that we need advanced manufacturing education because that's where it's going. So what, what's happening in manufacturing now is not Hervey make, weaving the fabric behind the machine. It's running the machine that's out there, running machine that's running 25 machines. And so what we tried to do is have a, the uh, Department of Education has these little modules that you can develop and they'll approve the CTE programs, career technical education programs. And I think we need more CTE programs. We tried to get the uh, Rogers High School interested in the CTE program, but they went in the way of boat building, which is right. 
but I, advanced manufacturing is hugely needed. So I think more CTE programs is, is absolutely needed. And I think more Fab Newports maker programs in the community is absolutely Newport and needed. The uh, Fab Newport, in fact, as right now, spread out into, uh, into the library system up in Providence. And they're getting $100,000 grants, even in this environment, financial environment, to spread the, the technology for Fab Newport. And the other thing, and I know you're running out of time. The, the, the other thing is that we, what we did, our, our, our group was, we paid for, my nonprofit paid for it. We had a coding class on, because a Zoom coding class on Saturday mornings, Tom Kowalczyk ran it. And we, we worked with, we had educators from Fab Newport and we had educators from uh, University of Rhode Island teaching coding to the kids from eight to 12 years old, just to excite them, to get them interested in coding, which is the next generation of jobs and opportunities. And we paid for it. It cost, uh, I think it was like three, $4,000 to pay for it. And they're continuing on another vendor, venue. So I think Zoom is allowing us to, to work with in the homes with, with some of these niches. Chris, you uh, mentioned it, and I think many people may associate or know that you're a proponent of regionalization or unification. What do you say to those voters that differ than you ideologically with school education? Yeah. Wireless? Yeah, I think, I just, I think I'm losing the batteries on my headset. Um, <laughs> what, 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 where do I see it with schools? No, um, the, qu the question was about regionalization, Chris. Correct. Um, at yeah, regionalization order. schools on the island. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So, well, we had a we had we had an initiative. Uh, we got twelve hundred signatures, which was difficult. Okay, it wasn't easy, especially in a pandemic environment. You try to get twelve hundred signatures in a pandemic, and well, we got it, and it went before the council, and 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 there was some really some legal questions about really had, what had occurred. But I think regionalization has to be examined. And that's what wasn't fair, that the, 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 people in, um, the people in Newport and the people in Middletown did not have the opportunity to sit down at the table. The things behind the curtains and the issues on regionalization are obvious, right? There's things like contracts, right? We have a contract. Why would we enter into a, an issue where we could have a problem with a contract? Lay it on the table. Talk about it. You know, um, the other times of location. Where would we could and lay out all the issues, right? And then go through them one by one. I, I again, I think that regionalization is something that would allow us to have more educational opportunities for our students, and maybe a by maybe a, a byproduct would be economics. Every time I I talk to people now, as I, they know I'm on a CSU uh, initiative, they come back and they say, "I can't believe they didn't talk about it." That's why you have whatever you got, 19 people running for town council. So, Chris, Chris let me ask one more time. You know, there are going to be voters out there that you're looking for their vote, and they may want to keep Middletown. There, there's Middletown voters that probably want to keep their school. There's Portsmouth voters. What do you say to those voters who don't want to see regionalization but want to support you? What What do you well, tell them? Well, what, what I tell them is, can we can we sit down at the table and talk about it, lay out the priorities, right? Lay out the object, objectives design it, the other was governance, lay out your issues, right? Then put together the program that what would make this the most sense for this group and then go back to the councils and let them decide and let the people decide on it. Let the people decide on, on, on regionalization. Then we just didn't get that chance. And um, I, there was actually, and have it facilitated. I know one of the local groups, one of the commerce groups just said, We'll pay for a facilitator just to talk, but give it give it its fair share. That's what I would say to them. Um, let me see here. Well, I've, got just, I've just got one one more question that I have, Chris, and that goes to the leadership in terms of the General Assembly. Would you find yourself being supportive of the uh, of the Speaker of the House, Matty Yellow, or um, or are you either not decided, or are you decided that you're going to go a different direction? It's the first time I was asked that question. 
Only kidding. No, I I don't have the experience with with the uh, with the with the speaker of the house. I can just tell you that I have a pretty full agenda right now with things that I'd like to get accomplished. And what I'd like to do is is to get together um, a coalition to, to lay out this plan and then go and sit down with the speaker and talk to him and see what his where he's he's at on it. I have I have no I have no experience with this. So why? You know, it's like somebody talking about Chris um, and they don't know me. I, I, I would work. I would lay out what my objectives were and see how we reacted. And then I'll give you a report card after that. Here you go, Chris. Why or how do you feel like you'll make a difference? Um, again, I have the experience and I know how to do this. I have um, uh, the drive. Um, I'm not always the most popular guy in the room, but I get things done. Um, I'm, my experience goes back to D.C. historically, um, and I had a practice of working again with teams and, and being able to create, making very, very difficult things happen. So I just, I, again, I ask for your vote um, on uh, upcoming for a Rhode Island District 72 representative on September 8th. Please come out and vote for me. It's an important election. It's an important for us to get things done uh, uh, these these two years. And you can trust in me and the things I pointed out, I will get done. Chris, how can people get in touch with you? I'm sorry? Okay. How can people so get I, in touch yeah, with you? Yeah. Uh, so my phone number is 401-864-0333. Uh, my email address, I'm one of three people in the country to still use it, is chrissemo at aol.com. And um, my, my web page, uh, my uh, Facebook page is Friends of Chris Seminelli. And thank you for the opportunity. You guys have been great. It was, it was fun. Miss any topic conversation issue that uh, you it's on your mind, but we didn't do. Yeah, you're breaking up on me now. Yeah, but I think I, I, think I got it. He wanted to know whether or not there was anything that we may have missed that uh, you wanted to make sure you touched on. Um, no, just that you know, I will I will attack the, the low hanging fruit, and um, I think that um, um, I, I look forward to. I, to be honest with you, I'm having a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, maybe maybe you're not supposed to, but I I am a, I'm having a great time with it. The, the, this is uh, I think my. Um, Maybe you call it an opponent, but I think it's been a, a very positive run, and we're 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 based on our our we're focusing on our own initiatives and our own policies, and that's the way it's supposed to be. Very good, All Chris. Right. Thank you very Chris much. Seminelli. Good luck. Thank you very Seminelli. much. Thank you. Best of luck. And uh, that is Chris Seminelli. He was running for district two, Middletown. You have a reason to go to the primary on or before the time race. And uh, open that Democratic primary. Of course, everybody in Rhode Island has a reason to go to the polls before or on September 8th. Frank, for this week, we uh, we fit in uh, 12 hours, 15 hours oh, yeah. of videos <laughs> in this week. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a busy week. It has been but a busy good. week. Uh, that's good. And it's a, we, we've, um, uh, I'm in uh, lots of different ideas. Uh, I, I will. I have to be honest that when when we bring up the the Black Lives Matter, and um, I just think that virtually every candidate has missed the point, and uh, it, it's uh, uh, it's it's a much deeper problem than what's. I just think people need to educate themselves a little bit more on how we we can approach that. But uh, difficult issues, question to answer. Lots of different approaches. Difficult question to answer, and we've gotten yep. now. 18, 19, I think we've gotten 24 different answers to almost all of our questions now. Um, so nobody is, uh, nobody's stealing each other's answers for certain. No, that's for sure. I write down sure. all different uh, answers and, uh, you know, some of them are very difficult to answer. And obviously if there was an easy answer, some of them would have been already solved, um, such yep. as climate change, such as, uh, you know, uh, Black Lives Matter and, um, many other issues. Um, next week, we're going to keep on going. We have to have a candidate for uh, 74 on, a candidate for 71 on. So um, we are, we've, in, we've invited all of the candidates on Quidnick Island in Nair um, who have a primary to participate. We're also going to go up to the congressional race. We're going to chat with uh, District 2, a Democratic opponent of David Cicilline. 
we'll and hopefully David Cicilline as well. And, and we're also going to try to see if we can get District 1 on. Where there are people That's who watch um, What's Up Noop from around the state. And we hope we get that. There's a primary in that election as well. All right. I just realized I'm all What's Up Noop shirt, hat, you know? Yeah. Just it's a Friday. So Friday at 4 o'clock. All right, man. Well, um, it was a good week. And I encourage everybody to visit What's Up Noop.com. We are have a rolling video. Uh, if I would challenge, there is no more. Oh no! <laughs> um, try to find somewhere that has more in depth uh, election twenty twenty coverage in Rhode Island than here, and we'll keep it going uh, for the next week and a half leading up to the primary, and then uh, we will go from September eighth to November third and get even crazier. And then after November third, we're going to find an election somewhere else across the globe. No, maybe not. <laughs> November 4th, I have a uh, live stream with Santa Claus. So there you we'll, go. Uh, we'll chat with him then. Outstanding. All right, Frank. Well, you have yourself a good weekend. That is a Paw Sox hat well. again today, right? Yep. Paw Sox? Uh, so it's Paw Sox. It's one of my Paw Sox hats. Okay. Several different kinds. All right. All right, Frank. Thanks. And we will uh, talk to you soon. All right. Take care. All right. On behalf of Frank Prosnitz and myself and all of us here at What's Up Noop, we want to thank Chris Seminelli for joining us today. Again, he is a Democratic candidate in District 72, Portsmouth and Middletown. You can find this video if you missed any portion of it and watch it again on whatsupnoop.com. Thanks for watching.